Welcome to the Plain Faith Podcast, Episode 6. For the first time, I brought my wife and two girls to a remote village, and we spent the night there. We're landing at the first airstrip, and my I had my, my 12-year-old daughter in the front seat, and she's like, Dad, what are you doing? Where Where's the runway? Where are you landing? <laughs> and I said, it's right in front of us. And she's like, that's not a runway. The Plain Faith Podcast is a podcast about missionary aviation and the stories of missionary aviators who have taken seriously Jesus' command to go and make disciples of all nations and are using airplanes to be His witnesses at the ends of the earth. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Your host for today's show will be Jimmy Tidmore, who, in addition to hosting this podcast, is a pastor and a pilot residing with his family in what is known as the Rocket City, Huntsville, Alabama. He is very interested in promoting missionary aviation and helping prospective missionary pilots reach the mission field. And now, with these introductions out of the way, let's get started on another great episode of the Plain Faith Podcast. Welcome back, and thanks for joining me for another episode of the Plain Faith Podcast. If you are a new listener, let me just say thanks for giving the show a shot. What you will find is that this is a podcast where we discuss a variety of topics related to missionary aviation. And on each episode, we have new and exciting guests who tell us about their experiences as missionary aviators or as those working in support of missionary aviation. And those stories really are the focus of the show. They are what make it interesting. So thanks for checking us out. I really do hope you'll become a regular listener. Now, for those of you who have been listening for a while, and many of you since the very beginning, I cannot begin to express my appreciation to you. I've got a lot going on right now, and truthfully, it is hard to carve out time to pull these episodes together. But your emails and your words of encouragement through social media and other places remind me that this show is having an impact, and there are folks out there who are really enjoying it. So thank you for reaching out and letting me know that you like what we're doing here. I would like to ask all of you to continue to help me get the word out. Our last episode was shared so much on social media that for a few days, we were ranked in the top 10 podcast under the aviation category on iTunes. At one point, we were as high as number three. And again, this was in the aviation category, nothing to do with Christianity or religion or anything like that. And because this is a podcast where we are talking about the gospel and Jesus Christ, that was pretty cool and exciting for me. So keep up the good work there. That is something I cannot do without you all. Another way you can help is by thinking and praying about becoming a patron of the show by visiting patreon.com slash plain faith. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash plain plain faith. We are currently just $3 shy of our first goal of $15 an episode, which is about what it will take to cover my monthly expenses for the show. No pressure there, but if you are enjoying the show and want to help me get it out to the world, think about and pray about if this is something you'd like to do. So now let's get to today's show. Once again, we have another outstanding guests. I just continue to be amazed at what these folks are bringing to the table during these interviews. In today's episode, we are going to hear from Pete Young, who is a missionary pilot serving with AIM Air in Kenya. He has a really good story to share, and I'm confident you'll enjoy hearing from him as much as I did. Pete, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Plain Faith Podcast. I can't wait to hear your story and have you share with our listeners about your work in Kenya and the journey that led you there in the first place, including how you developed a passion for aviation and about the route you took to become a missionary pilot. So thank you so much for being with us today. We look forward to hearing from you. You bet. I'm excited to be here, Jimmy. All right, Pete. Well, why don't we begin by having you tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from and where did you grow up? Okay, I grew up in Minnesota, um, born and raised. And uh, 
Actually, my both of my parents were pilots. My dad was a commercial pilot, but he uh, developed MS, multiple sclerosis, when he was 20, uh, 27. And uh, that kind of ended his commercial pilot career, but um, he stayed on with their with that company and did weather and flight scheduling and all that kind of stuff. And my parents built two airplanes together. And so that was kind of ingrained in my DNA, I think. But it kind of died for about 20 some years. So uh, it was there and that was kind of the beginning. But uh, yeah, I, I, I say I went to Oshkosh when I was seven months old. And then oh, wow. uh, every year until I was 10 and then didn't go back until I was 27. So there was a period in there where I guess aviation was kind of on the back burner, but God had different plans for all that. So Okay, well, that'll be interesting to hear more about how he brought that interest back into your life and then and then used that to lead you to the mission field. We'll get there in a little bit. So your your parents, your mom and your dad were both pilots. Is that what you said? Yeah, actually, my dad was a uh, a flight instructor as well. And so his his line to my mom when they met was he offered her free flying lessons. And of course, my mom's dad said, Ethel, nothing's for free. That's cool. So so your dad actually taught your mother how to fly? Yeah. Yep. That's, that's cool. And tell me about your, your wife and your children. I have a one wife, as we say in Africa. And uh, <laughs> very important to say I have one wife and I have four children. Um, and my oldest, my oldest two are boys and they are 16 and 14. And my, my girls are 12 and 9. Okay, cool. And where did you meet your wife? Uh, high school. We are high school sweethearts. I was a, uh, I was a senior and she was a sophomore. And I, I always say that's the only chance I had as being an older guy. So (laughs) it was cool to date the older guy. So I met her in high school and we, we dated and we got married young and uh, we don't regret it ever. Um, we always say, you know, if you, if you are both Christians and you're following the Lord, you know, go ahead, get married. We, she was 19 and I was 22 when we got married. So so tell us about how you became a follower of Jesus. Um, I grew up in a Christian home um, and, you know, raised my hand in VBS when I was in third grade. And, you know, that starts the process. Um, and through various stages in life, I, I was in a singing group. I played guitar in a singing group that went on several uh, summer tours, one year to Zimbabwe, Africa, one year to Guatemala and Honduras, and one year to India. And so when I when I joined that group, um, I really think that that was kind of a step in my faith of, you know, if I'm going to be representing Christ from the stage, I better be serious about it. Um, and so that was when I was in 11th grade. Um, it was just a really good, you know, stick in the ground to say this is a difference in my life. And being able to see God work through all those tours and and uh, just meeting kids and sharing Christ's love with them, that was it was a real faith builder. And there's been many things along the way. Obviously, I think that you know different things cause different steps in your life to go deeper with Christ. And some of those are part of my story to get to Africa. Obviously, it's it's kind of a major change, but uh, but the mu- music has always been a part of my life. I. I led worship. Uh, we planted a church in 1998, and I led worship there from the start until we left, really, for missionary training in 2012. So that that aspect of it's always been a big part of my life as well. So why don't you tell us about your call to missions? When did that happen, and, and how did it take place? Was it something that was immediate, or did it take place over time? Yeah, no, that's a um, great question. In 2010, in the fall of 2010, my wife, who is an avid reader, uh, would read me passages from Francis Chan's Crazy Love. And I, I, like, I like to read manuals. I was an electrical engineer before being a pilot. So <laughs> I like manuals. I like facts. Um, and uh, not so much... Uh, anything else besides the Bible. But uh, yeah, so so she would read me little snippets of this book called Crazy Love, and I was 
I was like, yeah, that sounds sounds like a really good book. And we ended up doing uh, doing it as a small group study with three different groups. And uh, I remember through that process, at one point, it, I, God just used the, the whole book to stir to stir me. And at one point, we were just in a heated discussion in our kitchen, and I just said, "Well, what are we supposed to do? Just sell everything? This is, you know, where where does it end? Where does it end?" And uh, it was really kind of the death of my, um, you know, any any semblance of works based theology that I had was gone at that point, and just realizing that, you know, it's who cares if I lead worship? It's, it's not, it's not a thing, you know, it doesn't make me better or worse than anybody else. It's just something that God's gifted me to do. Um, you know, and there's no amount of selling things and doing things that is, that is any better than anything else else. And that, um, I think that realization really started me and the Holy Spirit just started working in me. And through that process, it took about a year. I really had an unrest. The Holy Spirit just kind of stirred in me, and I had unrest, and I didn't know maybe I was supposed to be um, leading worship full time, or or you know something. I knew it was something, and I I spent a week um, doing lunch fast. So I would during lunchtime I would just go to a park nearby my work and and just pray. And I that whole week I just prayed, okay, God, if I don't say no, <laughs> what do you want me to do? And about the third day in, I aviation just popped into my head and I and that's the first thing that really did that and I was like I didn't think anything of it the next day it, it was really clear on my mind and um, by by Friday I was like wow I I really think I'm supposed to go into mission aviation and I came home and told my wife that and she kind of chuckled a little bit and said okay that's that's cute <laughs> it's I, I I had been um, attuned to doing some off some crazy things and I built an airplane myself and so she's just kind of chalked that up as to one more of those episodes of this is something that he's going to do okay that's cute but as we looked into it the church I grew up in had a a missionary pilot that furloughed um, in our church and so I emailed him right away and he was very encouraging and and he's he's with jars um, and said yeah that's great and you should get some more information but shouldn't be a problem and and all this stuff. So he was very encouraging. And that's really kind of the journey to where we got to. It kind of continued on it. I, it was right before Oshkosh, um, 2011. And I, I went there with so many questions. Um, and I talked to all the MAF guys and the JARS guys and, and uh, just said, you know, am I too old for this? And, and, a lot, and both of them kind of said, well, you're kind of getting up there. I was 30. I think I was 35 at the time, and they all said, we'd like to have you by the time you're 40, so, you know, you already have your private license, but you'd have to get a maintenance license and your commercial and um, all those other things. So I guess that's kind of how I got to the training aspect of it as well. But, uh, but yeah, it was just really, it really took a year. Um, it was a long process, and it's not something that um, that I really desired to do. Some people are out here, and they're like, since I was five, I wanted to be a missionary or, or a pilot or something like that. But it's really something that um, God has called us to. And I think there's such a peace in holding it loosely like that, is, is that if it ends tomorrow, I'm okay with that because God's got something else. And that's, that's always reassuring. So, so Pete, having told us about your call to, to missions, would do you have any advice for someone who maybe is listening to this episode and wrestling with a call to missions themselves? Anything you could say as they are working through that decision? Um, you know, one of the really important things that we did was bounce it off our good friends in our small group. And that goes into saying that it's so good to have peers and people who sharpen you um, around you at all times. It's, I don't think it's a decision that you would make lightly. Um, it's not a decision that you would make on your own, but you would get input from other people. And when we told our small group about it, um, they really came at us with some really hard questions that first time we said anything. And it was about an hour. They just peppered us. So what about this? And what about your kids? And what about um, your family and support team and all this stuff? So they, they really vetted um, a lot of the things that we had thought about, but 
it was so good to hear it coming from somebody else as well. And in the end, they're like, yeah, I guess we don't want to lose you, but this is really something that God probably has gifted you for. And yeah, they, they, they approved <laughs> and uh, still do. And actually right now we have one of our families who is in that small group here visiting us with their kids. So it's, it's a, just a huge blessing, but it, it's like I was saying, it, it's always good to, to get wisdom from others and um, to seek God in all of that, and to never hold those plans too tight, because you know God can change those, and as soon as they, as soon as we make them ours, and it becomes a pride issue, if they get taken away, then then we have problems, and we start blaming God for things and and that. So it, it is something that you want to make sure that it's from God, but then don't say no. I mean, it, it, I think that many people are called into ministry or into missions or something, and they just don't do it. Um, and it leads to, in my opinion, it leads to, you know, not living life to the fullest. And you, you don't get, um, you don't grow as deep spiritually. You don't have as many blessings of people around you and supporting and and um, just seeing God work. I mean, that's one of the biggest blessings that we have here is that, just being able to see God work every day. And um, not that it can't happen anywhere, but because we're, we've surrendered, um, I think God moves through that. And so um, just struggle through it and get advice and um, don't hold it as, as your dream, but hold it as something God wants you to do now. And if he changes that, be okay with it. Okay, very good. So one piece of advice that that I heard there was obviously you're going to have an, a, a personal inward call, a, a compulsion to to uh, get involved in missions somewhere in the world, but the church has a role to play in sort of confirming that call. Is that right? That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And our, our sending church is a major part of us getting here. And like I said earlier, I have this um, led worship in this church for 13 years and, and really had so many relationships with people there that this church really has sent us and, and uh, been behind us and continues to be there. And if we ever had problems, you know, I could count on my hand that, you know, my, maybe five or six or seven people would just get on a plane for us. And it's just having that kind of a support team, um, is what makes this all work really for us and uh, being just having people with us. Okay, very good. So let's transition now and talk a, a little bit about your flight training. So you talked about how as a child you were exposed to aviation at a very young age and had parents that were passionate about aviation. Then you said that that passion went dormant for a while how did you rediscover that passion and get back involved in aviation again? Yeah, that's a good story. It, it was my, actually, my wife's brother um, got an ultralight. And uh, that's what sparked it all. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember flying. That 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 would be fun to do again. And uh, so if it, he, he is kind of the one to blame. And, and I remind my wife of that once in a while. You know, it's, it's your brother's fault. And... Uh, <laughs> But it, uh, I ended up buying an ultralight um, as well, and uh, but I didn't have my pilot's license, so I flew that for a couple months, and and actually it got it grounded, it got grounded because of nine eleven, and uh, yeah. you know when they had no flying and all that, and so I was I was just kind of sitting there wanting to fly but couldn't, and my dad um, entered into the picture and said, you know, how about you sell that ultralight and use it to buy pay for your flying lessons. And I was like, yeah, that's probably a good idea. So that's, that's how I ended up getting my private pilot's license. I sold the ultralight and just did FBO training to get, to get my private. And, uh, and then, you know, being the logical person that I am, I said, well, my parents built an airplane. It is the cheapest way to fly and the best way to learn, uh, some skills. So I, I built a two seat, uh, Titan tornado. Um, and it's a kit, and um, fun little airplane to fly. And I flew that um, a lot, uh, probably almost 100 hours in a summer, and wow. uh, gave a ton of rides. And But then just realized that at the time we had two kids, and I couldn't fit them in there, and I really wanted to build something bigger. So 
I sold that and uh, started building a Bearhawk from scratch, which is a four-place airplane um, that can really haul a lot. It's kind of like a one. It's a similar to a 182 um, Cessna 182. Um, and then I would rent along the way and just kind of keep my flying up a little bit. But more more often than not, I'd I'd say, well, I'd rather take this money and buy some more aluminum for my airplane versus go flying. So. Um, that even the flying kind of went dormant for five to six years while I was building my Bearhawk. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. How how many hours slash years did it take you to to build those two aircraft? Yeah, so the the Titan Tornado, um, since it was a kit and it was re- I I really enjoy the the process of that uh, um, kit. It really it took me three hundred and twenty five hours to build. I mean, virtually nothing and uh, 13 months, and it was in the air. So that one was really fast, um, and uh, really liked the process, the factory, the guys were really, really super helpful. And what, what kind of tipped the scale is there was three other guys at the airport I was flying out of that had them. So I could, they came over one day, and we had most of the ribs uh, riveted to the, the D-cell and on the wing, and, and things just went really fast with their help too. So... But the Bearhawk, that was a 10-year process, and I actually I sold it to a guy, and I think he's from Wyoming. I haven't checked to see if he's finished it yet, but I had the wings all finished. They were all aluminum, um, just like a Cessna wing, and uh, the fuselage was tube and, fa- tube and fabric, and I had the, the, the fuselage was finished welded, um, but I didn't have any of the landing gear or tail section or anything like that finished, so... Um, it probably would have taken at my current pace probably another four to five years to finish it, but uh, but it was definitely on the back burner a lot, and it would be, you know, sometimes it would be a month before I'd get back down to the workshop because I didn't want my kids and my family to suffer um, in just just to get this airplane done. So it was really, really was like. <laughs> Father's Day gifts were easy. Honey, you can have a whole eight hours in the workshop. Okay. <laughs> you know, so that was kind of the kind of the norm for that. All right, very cool. I I've, I've always been interested in 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 that process of of building an, an airplane. I know that takes a lot of commitment. It does, yeah, for sure. So you said that you did your original flight training for your private pilot certificate at just a regular old FBO, right? That's correct. And then where did you go on from there to do your, your further flight training? And, and was the further flight training uh, pretty much necessitated because of your call to mission aviation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, I, what happened was that the Oshkosh 2011 is where I was turned on to SMAT, um, the School of Missionary Aviation Technology in Ionia, Michigan. And um, they have a one-year A&P program and a one-year flight program. And uh, both JARS and MAF were uh, said, you know, you wouldn't make it through Moody and, and make it to the field in time. So you're going to have to look for sh- quicker ways to get there. Um, it really worked well for me at SMAT, um, especially since I had built, uh, I had building experience, I had flight experience. And so I walked into there um, really just filling in holes, especially in regulations. Um, I knew how to, you know, do all the major steps in repairing an aircraft, but um, didn't have a lot of experience with, okay, so I can't put that on a certificated airplane, Uh, you know, that kind of thing. So it was good to fill in those regulatory holes. And and then the flight aspect, they really focus on mission training. And we had six pilots um, in our flight class. Uh, We had 30, well, 29 students in our maintenance school and only six in the flight. So, um, but we would focus on, you know, how, how, okay, really precision flying. And that's something that I missed out on, on on the FBL training, um, was I think back now having the training at SMAT and I, I think I probably should have killed myself probably a couple of times, but, uh, um, knowing, knowing what I know now, and they really do a great job of, uh, just the physics behind flight and knowing the airplane and okay, if I, you know, which wing stalls, the balls, what way, and you're going to unport fuel based on what, and this, and, you know, you can't do drops at this 
uh, altitude and things like that, um, they really focus on training aviators for the mission field. And, um, you know, I know Moody is kind of the, the, the watermark of mission training, um, but SMAT has done a great job to listening to what JARS and MAF said that they want out of training, and they've taken that and written curriculum. So, I, yeah, I wouldn't have, I, I don't think I ever would have gotten my even my instrument had I just been recreational flying. But uh, after the the year of aviation or a year of flight at SMAT, I, I got, you get, you, you can, you, you can start from scratch there and you get private and then you get your, um, all your, uh, some hours built up and then you get your instrument rating and then uh, your commercial at the end. So you get, I had coming in, I had 200 and about 225 hours of private, just recreational flying. And so I started with a, you know, kind of a jump start. And, um, and so I think you need 250 for your commercial. So that's right. Yeah. So I, I, you, if you start from private, you get 250, um, and probably not a lot more, um, because of the time constraints. But, uh, yeah, I left, I left SMAT with 400 and about 60. So that's about where I ended up. So let, let me ask you this, and, I, and I'm asking actually because I had a conversation with a listener of the show not too long ago and was asking sort of about, he already has a private pilot's license or was, was working on it, I believe, and he was kind of trying to figure out the route to go from there. Do you think someone who's done some training and has some time uh, just through a traditional FBO route, do you think SMAT is, is a, a good option for them? I think so. Um, they know they really did a great job of helping me to unlearn some really bad habits and to mm. uh, cement the good ones. And the hard thing with prior training, they don't recommend it. They, you know, they they mm. say just just start from scratch here because the primacy of learning is really what you go down to in a in right. your weakest moment. You're going to end up doing what it, what you learned, and I I have to mitigate that. Not as much now. It's it's become. Uh, you know, I've, I've really beat those, those, uh, bad habits to a pulp, but I could see where they would still rear their head in an emergency. You know, you just get, um, you just go back to how you first learned. And so it is tough, but, but having said that, if you already have experience, um, they do a good job and they know the dangers of those, um, early training experiences. So they do a, they do a very thorough job of, of working through those with you. Yeah, very good because you would just hate to say to somebody, "Oh, you've you've already learned how to fly." Well, no, you you can't go to the mission field, right? So, so I was trying to talk to this individual about a route uh, he could he could take to to still uh, get properly trained and so forth. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it it a place like SMAT definitely takes that into account and and works through those things. Okay, very good. Well, I'm I will include a link to SMAT in, in the show notes of, of this episode for anyone who would be interested in, in connecting with them. Yeah, that'd be great. So do you have any advice for someone who is thinking about becoming a missionary pilot and about how to do flight training? Obviously, uh, you've talked about SMAT a little bit, but maybe even someone who's in flight training and working to become a missionary pilot. Any advice for somebody who's who, who's who's doing that right now? Um, you know, the biggest thing that I think is key on just about everything is you can't be perfect, but you can strive for excellence. And so staying, you know, we always, we always say you're returning to standard. You know, you don't fly along 50 feet high or 50 feet low, you return and to your altitude. And then if you're off again, you return again. And you just, it's a, just a constant process of returning to the standard. And if you can hold those standards tighter um, it just really helps you out in everything that you do, um, in maintenance, in flight, in planning, um, all the, all those things. If you can, you, you, you will never be perfect. And uh, there's always something every flight that I review afterwards and say, I could have done this better. I should have done this, but striving towards ex excellence is, is the goal. All right. Thank you very much. One thing that I think I've heard from a, a few guys, and I would be interested in your opinion on it, is, you know, there are the FAA standards that you're going to have on your your check ride, and those are good for 
certifying pilots to be safe and so forth. But if you're headed towards the mission field, those standards are not what you need to be striving for. You need to be, like you said, maintaining altitude within 50 feet and getting back to that standard immediately. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's what at at SMAT they always had a tighter tolerance on us than uh-huh. what the what the commercial standards were because they wanted to build that in. You know, if you're if you're used to being letting 200 feet go, um, it's yep. really a lot harder to teach yourself to stay within 50 or you know just constantly. You're always checking. You're always returning, and that's the that's the mental aspect you want to have. Is I'm always returning to one degree off or, or, you know, right to the, the, the correct heading or the right altitude or the correct airspeed versus just letting it go. And so that's the, the, really the mindset you want to have. Yeah. So in, for even someone in working on their private pilot certificate right now, if they're headed towards the mission field and they feel that's where God's leading them, don't be content with the FAA standards. Be, be content with something a little bit tighter. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. I've just heard that time and time again. All right. Well, tell us about the place you're serving now. What's it like? Tell us where you're at and how it's different than your home and, and what are some of the things that you've had to, to, to get adjusted to and so forth? Yeah, we are serving with AMER um, and we are a smaller organization. We fall under JARS for our safety and our standards. Um, JARS calls it a, a subscribing organization. Um, and so we're under their umbrella for all that, which is really a good thing to have for a smaller organization. We're based in Nairobi, Kenya, the AMER is, and that's our main base. But we have two out of Nairobi programs. One is in Arua, Uganda, which is in the northwest corner of Uganda. And one is in um, the northwest corner of Kenya called Lokachogio, and that's where we're based. Um, and we do most of our flying into South Sudan. We do a little bit of flying into northern Kenya, but most of it is up north into South Sudan and supporting the missionaries up there. Um, we fly we fly mainly for the church, so pastors and, and short-term teams and really our the, the AIM, Africa Inland Mission, our missionaries up in South Sudan, we serve them. That is our our main goal is to keep those people supplied and and uh, pull them out in emergencies. And this past year, we've pulled them out. We've pulled three different teams out because of unrest and uh, tough situations to be in. But really, it's what we're here for, and it is great to know that you know we are where we we're needed. You know, I think as far as getting used to things, it's very different than flying in the U.S. from a flight aspect. There's no weather reporting here, so um, that's something you really have to get used to because we're so, in the U.S., we're so used to just dialing up the weather, and you can get it 10 different ways, and even in the air, you can get it, and uh, and we're so accustomed to getting that right now. And so here, you basically just look at the sky, and you go, well, the clouds are uh, high enough, and then you call your destination, and they say, yeah, they're not quite at the top of the mountain yet, and so you're like, okay, I can I can get in there. <laughs> so yeah. it, it, it's something that's very different than the U.S. Um, and and we have turbulence here constantly. After 10 a.m., it's just turbulent. Um, and uh, by the afternoon, coming back into Lokichogio it can be really brutal in a light 206. Um, yeah. It just tosses you around, and you have to slow way down to to uh, maneuvering speed and. <laughs> It's kind of a at the, after, at the end of a long day. The last thing you want to do is slow down to get home, but you really have to to protect the airplane. So, um, but it's something that I've I think I've gotten used to. Whereas in the U.S., I don't think I ever flew in turbulence. Maybe one time I was in moderate turbulence, but uh, this is almost every afternoon. It's moderate. Um, I've not been in heavy turbulence, but it's just constantly moderate turbulence. So, it's it's somewhat unpleasant. It. Uh, very hazy because of dust in the air. They call it harmaton. Um, it's you know it can lower visibility. I've I've had it as bad as it's like mile and a half, two miles up in South Sudan. And whether they're doing a slash and burn, they burn thousands of acres at a time just uh, during the dry season. And so it's just this massive cloud of smoke that you're flying through. So and they don't have South Sudan doesn't have uh, a really strong civil aviation department there's no there's no radar in the whole country 
Um, and one airport, the capital city of Juba, has an instrument approach, but that's it. And so you're really you're really self policing with a lot of UN and Red Cross and and uh, different organizations flying up there like that. I've gotten really good at understanding Russian English. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of Russian pilots flying U and aircraft, so you get used to the accents and you can kind of pick them out. MAF and, and Samaritan's Purse are the other two uh, organizations flying heavily in uh, South Sudan with us. And uh, it's, we, we just have a really good camaraderie with them. And it's just cool to see how God uses us all as different aspects of his work up there. So tell us about how that you end up, ended up in Kenya and with AIM Air. You talked about being at Oshkosh and meeting with the JARS folks and the MAF folks. And somewhere along the way, you connected with AIM Air and, and decided you were going to head to Africa. So how did that happen? Yeah, it, it uh, was part of that when I came home and told my wife that we were going into mission aviation. And she chuckled and then said, all right, well, let's find out some more information about it. And in 2011, there just wasn't very much out there, actually. It wasn't that long ago, but um, JARS had, like, a really bad video on their website taken from a handheld something, and and uh, MAF didn't have anything. And so I found this place called Africa Inland Mission, and they had, like, handfuls of really high-quality video. And uh, two of them were about aviation, and, and the one story... There's one video called uh, Four Stories, One Heart that we showed to everybody and uh, because it, it perfectly explained the four aspects of missionary aviation from um, maintenance, um, pilot, to missionary on the ground, to local person who was affected by all this and how it all worked together. And so I loved it. I was like, wow, these guys really understand how to tell a story. And <laughs> it was just kind of funny. So as we as we kept using this video... I think God kept putting it in our hearts. You know, maybe this is where you should serve. It is probably the hardest thing you have to pray about. We felt anyway is, well, where do we serve? Because you can, there's very many places to serve. So um, it we loved the size of the organization where it's small and you can, you're a part of decision making. We love that aspect of it. But we also love, like I was saying before, the umbrella and being under jars and having that safety net there. There's oversight, and uh, we are held to a standard. And so those two aspects I really appreciated. Then we met several of the pilots at Oshkosh, and some of them were home on home assignments, so we met them there. Just awesome people to serve with. Um, and uh, we just fell in love with, with what they're doing. And being able to spend time on the ground with missionaries, we heard about that. And sure enough, when we're here, a lot of times we'll do one or two overnights just to help out. Um, and so we get to spend time with missionaries and my wife has hosted several missionaries who come through town. I'll fly them out and they'll stay overnight here until their next flight the next day. And we just really get to know them and, and, uh, love their ministry and how God's using them as well. So the, the funny story is that the media department at Africa in the mission was started by two pilots. And so they, they, they were, felt the need to tell the stories. And so they're, you know, they're flying around. Uh, Mike DiLorenzo and Ted Rurup are out flying around and they're like, you know, nobody's telling these stories of the missionaries and the people. And so they just got a heart for it and um, really went after it with some just high quality and uh, loved what I love what they're doing. And when I found that out, I was like, I knew it. <laughs> so um, it was just really cool to connect with it. And that's, I think that's really how God led us to it. Okay, so if somebody wanted to find out more about African Inland Mission or AMAIR, their website sound like a good place for them to go? Yes, absolutely. AMAIR.org um, and AIM.org is uh, are, are the websites that we have, and there, there's all sorts of links. Um, obviously, you could message me, um, and I can point you in the good direction too, but most of those videos are up, and, and uh, you know, there's all sorts of information up there. Um, sorry, it's A-I-M-I-N-T dot org. That's the main web page for, for Africa and the mission. So yeah, it, all that information's up there. Very good. So uh, again, in the show notes, I'll have links to that. And also we'll get around at the end to talking about how people can contact you and, and, and connect with you. Cool. Very good. 
Okay, so why don't you tell us about, obviously you were led to AMER and you had fin- you were coming to the conclusion of your training at SMAT. Then what was the process of coming on board with AMER? I'm sure there was some interviews and some evaluations and some flying and so forth. How did that process unfold? Yeah, it's about a 35-point uh, process, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah. In general, um, if I can remember the process correctly, it's you do a formal application to AIM, and uh, that's the start of it, actually, before any of the flying. They want to know if you're interested in being an AIM missionary before um, before you pass any of the, the um, technical pieces of it. So you apply to AIM, and once you're accepted, then you can um, go through the technical process, which... Um, being a JARS subscribing organization, we do all of our training through JARS. And so you do a technical evaluation with JARS, which is a two-week, basically it's described as a two-week job interview. And you go to Waxhaw, North Carolina for two weeks. And the first week is maintenance. And so they put you through, they give you a whole bunch of different um, tests and subjects and you build something um, out of metal and you, you explain fuel systems and you um, you just do all this maintenance stuff for a week, and they evaluate you. Then the next week, they have you uh, basically teach yourself how to fly the Helio Courier, which is an airplane. It's a tail dragger um, and that most most people have never heard of or certainly not flown before. So they give you the manual the weekend before, and you read the manual, and you make notes, and you basically teach yourself how to fly this airplane, and they watch you. They have an instructor, obviously, in the seat next to you the whole time, and, and he's evaluating you. And basically, one of the things they look for is how do you fail and what do you do when you fail? Because a big part of their evaluation is your attitude. Um, they have something called KSAs, Knowledge, Skills, and Attributes. And so they rate you on your knowledge, your skills, and I, I would say it's almost most heavily weighted towards the attributes. So they want to know what your attitude is. Um, They want to know, like I said, how you fail and how you pick yourself back up and, um, you know, how are your hazardous attitudes and all of that. And, you know, they'll tell you, well, you obviously have your ANP and you have your commercial license. So we know you can fly, but we want to know the other stuff that's most important. So, um and once you get through that, um, if you are suited for for the organization, then you're accepted um, into their their orientation process. And so you you basically you finish the technical evaluation, you go home, you finish raising your support, <clears throat> and then we went through something called a connect week with AIM, where it's a week you spend at AIM headquarters. And you learn very briefly about the African culture and the culture that you'll live in um, and some of the gotchas and some health things and things like that. But it's really kind of a brief uh, orientation. And then then you're on to um, technical orientation at JARS. And that's a three-month process where you do, they split it up half time. You do uh, maintenance and flying and um, kind of the highlight of the flying is at the end of technical orientation you you do what they call mountain week and you spend 10 days in the smoky mountains and flying into really short airstrips with the probably the least amount of margin you'll see they say your 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 skills are at about peak when you're at mountain week and uh-huh. and uh, you can really just set it down on a on a dime and and you can nail air speeds and all that kind of stuff so it's it's really fun enjoyable flying and the maintenance is good too where you're just kind of reviewing Okay, so they knew I was going with AMR, and so I did a lot of 206 maintenance there. Um, re-rigged some flaps and ailerons and and uh, just uh, did a 100-hour inspection and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, really just cementing all that kind of stuff in the maintenance aspect of it. And then, once you're done with technical orientation, you are released to the field, and uh, you have all your support in place, and uh, basically you had to your your place and ours is Africa so we came and uh, that's when we did what AIM calls their Africa based orientation where it's a lot deeper it's three weeks of culture culture and culture and uh-huh. you, you learn so much more um, because we have Kenyans teaching it and um, 
it's so useful to learn and hear from them and and just be a be get a head start on on what we're going to be around and and with so very helpful so what was the adjustment process like for your family uh, in, including your children um it's been um, it's been good and bad and rough and okay. And I think yeah. we're probably about normal with everybody, but, um, there's times where you're just, um, for us, it, it was, it's a twofold or three or fourfold, but we, our kids had always gone to public school in the U S and so coming to Africa, <clears throat> knowing that we were going to serve in an out of Nairobi program. We said we're going to have to homeschool, and our boys, we were going to send them to boarding school. And we didn't say that right away. Actually, what we said was we're never sending our kids to boarding school, ever. And then uh -huh. we, we learned about the school that AIM has here in Kenya and just how awesome it is and the, the environment they'd be around and the mentors that they would have. And and we just said, yeah, this is this is what God really has for our kids. And it's just been a huge blessing to us. RVA, the Rift Valley Academy, has been an awesome place for our boys. And our girls are begging to go. So <laughs> my wife is like, no, stop the bleeding. They need to stay here for a little longer. So um, so that's been a huge adjustment. Just um, having the kids around for homeschooling and then having the boys gone um, for three months at a time and then having them home for a month, that's been a huge adjustment. And just um, things like that are are tough, to, you know, tough to do. My father actually passed away last July. And so we had been in Kenya for six months and I went home for the funeral and I took the boys, but my wife and girls stayed back in Kenya. And that was really, that was tough. It was it was tough on her, um, and she made the decision to stay home um, because for several reasons. But I think that if she came home, if she went home to the U.S. at that time, she probably wouldn't have wanted to come back. Just because at that point, six months, you're just really struggling with what are we doing here? I, I miss my family. I want to. I just want to go to Target. I just you know. <laughs> The, yeah. I just want to go shopping, you know, I, it's all the little things start to add up. And I think all those adjustments have been made and we've started to thrive. We got to Lokichogio, which is another change because um, it's it is our town up here is really remote. I mean, it's village living um, at its finest. So we have two general stores in town and a grocery store that's about the size of our old walk-in closet in Minnesota. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really, um, an adjustment, but we've, we, we enjoy it up here, um, because we like the small size of the town. We know a lot of the people, um, and you just make a, I think a deeper connection with people because of that. So. Yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing honestly there. One of the goals I have for this show is to expose people who are considering missionary aviation or just missions in general to not just the romanticized stories of right. it, but reality. And, and, and we tend to think missionaries are some special part of God's creation <laughs> uh, when in reality, they're just, they're just regular people who have been faithful to a call to go and it doesn't mean it's easy. Oh my goodness. It, no, it, it's, it's, it's very, it's very difficult to leave family and what's familiar and go live in a, a place that's, that's not anything like your home. That's exactly right. That's, that's so true. And it's not, it certainly is not for the faint of heart, but we are not rock stars. We're not, you know, we're, we're just regular people that said yes and um, struggle with just life um, on a, on a daily basis. And, and it's tough. Like that, that's one of the hardest things that is about living up here is just the isolation. And I, and it is a desert, like climate, climate wise where we live is very deserty. It's um, very dry a lot. And we're actually in a huge, massive famine and drought right now. And Northern Kenya is looking at millions of people who are hungry and possibly dying they're saying it's it might be one of the worst famines ever 
um, if it if it keeps going. And so they're kind of gearing up for that. But along with that is just the desert of spiritual life and the desert of relationships. And it's so hard. You really have to be so intentional about um, your spiritual well-being because there's nobody here to tell you, oh, hey, are you reading your Bible? You know, are, how's your prayer life? And and all that kind of stuff. It's so easy to just um, not do it, basically. Um, you have to be disciplined and you have to have that support team that's behind you asking those questions and and really pursuing you in that aspect. But it um, it can be so hard because of the isolation. So and you're out of your culture and church. Church can be beautiful. And last night, even we, we had a fellowship with our church and it was just a large meal and we sang and, you know, shared with each other and it was really fun, but it's still not my culture, you know, especially as somebody who loves music and, and it's so is not my music. So <laughs> it's, it's just something that is a struggle constantly. Um, and a reminder that I, this is not where I'm from. Um, but God has me here and, um, I will find joy, um, intentionally in it, but I have to be intentional. All right. Well, how about something that um, took you completely by surprise, maybe even a, in a humorous way now about you living in, in Kenya and particularly in a remote part of, of Kenya? Do you have any stories you'd share that we might enjoy? Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the, the surprise aspect that was was the desert um, that that did surprise me. I thought, you know. I've I've been really good at at uh, maintaining spiritual disciplines and all that, but when you get up here, it's just you're just tired, and and that surprised me is just how how willingly my flesh was like I'm just I don't want to get up any earlier than I have to. I just want to sleep in. I don't want to spend a quiet time, and so making myself do it was a real surprise. Um, from that aspect, from a humor aspect, um, I. It surprises me and and maybe you know maybe it shouldn't but the the kids here it's like in this town if you have white skin you are a celebrity like they I've been we've been here for 6 months and people have been up here for years and years since you know who knows how long there's been uh westerners up here in Loki but every time you drive down the street there's kids, hello, 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 and they just wave at you. And then there's a guy right behind you, a Kenyan driving behind you, and there's nothing. They don't. <laughs> and and one of the one of the uh, we I've given a, a ride to one of the airport workers several times, and I'm like, you know, they're waving at you. They're waving at you, Joseph. You are the celebrity. And he just laughs. He's like, no, 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 that is you. <laughs> the kids, and they they just come up to you and they they pull on your arm hair because. They, they've never seen arm hair before. They, they just pull on you and poke you and pinch you. And they're just so curious about your hair. And it's just hilarious. So. so let's talk a little bit now about the type of flying that you do and, and your typical day. And I know that it's probably not a typical day, but the, the, the typical types of flights that you do and the type of work that you do and, and you're flying in a 206. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And and you're right. We because Amir um serves the church, we're we're all charter. We have no scheduled flights. And so it really is dependent on people asking for flights. Um so there can be weeks where we'll have I'll have three, maybe four flights in a week, and then there's weeks where I have one or even none. Next week there's nothing on the books, but people call and say, Hey, tomorrow can I get a flight? And so um, things really pop up quickly and you just kind of have to be ready. Um, so from that aspect, um, if I have a flight, a lot of times, well, the sun comes up here at seven or six fifty AM almost every day. Cause we're close to the equator. Um, so the earliest I can take off is six fifty. Um, so I don't have the really early mornings, uh, that some people do. Uh, but, uh, I'll get there, and depending on when the passenger wants to leave or when I have to pick them up from somewhere, I'll uh, let's say they just want to get in to uh, South Sudan, and so then they'll meet me at the airplane at seven thirty. I'll get I'll get to the airport at probably six thirty and start 
pre-flight and uh, do some planning and, and call on the weather. Um, and by 7.30, the passenger might show up and we'll load um, and uh, load. And if he's if it's a cargo flight, a lot of times we'd like to load it before the day before just to get it all the weight and balance all figured out and then it tied down so that there's no surprises in the morning. Um, and then we, uh, yeah, we, we actually have a control tower here in Loki. Um, and so we just get our flight plan filed and, and, uh, then head out and we have for the 206, I have airstrips. Um, we only have two special purpose airstrips, like, so airstrips that require an airborne committal point, um, or a one-way airstrip, um, or even weight limits. So the uh-huh. ones that I fly into, there's only two of those because um, yeah, Africa is a, a lot of it's pretty flat and dry. So uh, at least this part of it, not not the Congo, but uh, but this part of it is. And so um, you know, I'll have typically I'll have about 2,700 feet of runway. Our shortest airstrip is 15, uh, it's about 1,600 feet. And, uh, and that one's a little bit of a tricky runway because it's, if it, if it's rained, it, uh, it can turn into a quicksand. So <laughs> we're, uh, not allowed to land there if within 24 hours of a rain. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you, you check all that kind of stuff and, and, uh, we do a supply run for our missionaries in South Sudan. And so that'll be a, I'll take off and we have one, two, three, four, five stops that we go to. And so we'll drop off things at each location. And sometimes the people want to catch a ride to an, one of the other villages. And so they'll hop on and I'll, um, it really is one of those um, typical in quotation marks uh, uh-huh. missionary aviation flight where you're, shuttling cargo and people back and forth and and it's a full day and a lot of times those are two or three days because the uh the unit leader will want to ride with you and and visit some of the places and he'll want to stay overnight and uh um so so those are kind of fun i i really enjoy have come to love those flights because you get to spend the night and you have a meal with the missionaries and see their ministry talk to their uh people on the ground and and really get a good feel for what what they're doing there so your your flying includes moving people from place to place and cargo supplies from place to place. That's right. Yep. So what would you say is the most exciting part about the the flying that you do or just about being a, a missionary aviator in general? I told somebody a, a couple of flights ago that, you know, flying is large amounts of boredom end capped by sheer terror, moments of sheer terror. So... <laughs> But, uh, and that's the, the thing is that I had to remember, actually I had to learn that most of the people that I fly are reluctant flyers. They have to fly. They don't want to fly, you know, and that's different from recreational aviation where you're like, Hey, let's go flying for a hundred dollar hamburger. Yeah, let's go. You know, it's a lot of fun, but up here it, people fly because they have to, not because of it's a, not because it's a joy ride. So they, uh, I think some of the most exciting times, um, to use that word are just the landings. Um, you know, where you can, I love being able to pick out a spot and just hit it and, uh, come in and, and, uh, it doesn't always work out that way. Um, but when it does, if there's a sense of fulfillment, you know, and you're like, all right, we're, we're good. Um, the, I think my first, uh, I, I flew a team at the end of their trip, a short-term team at the end of their trip to a game park here. Wow. And so that I had to, uh, I had to do a low pass to get the uh, warthogs off the runway. That was new. Um, so that was kind of fun, yeah. but, uh, but things like that, where you're anything out of the norm is it brings excitement where you're like, okay, you know, yesterday, actually, um, I flew into a, an airstrip and, uh, there was a huge, um, the largest helicopter helicopter built called the MI 26 was right smack dab in the middle of the runway where I was going. And he had stopped and was unloading and I called him and, and, uh, he eventually responded in broken English with a heavy Russian accent that he was going to be 30 minutes. And I said, um, (laughs) okay, well, if you could hurry, I would really appreciate it. So we just circled and I had plenty of fuel. So, I wasn't concerned. I throttled back and and uh, leaned out the engine, and we sipped fuel for 25 minutes while he unloaded. And um, 
came into land and, and it was a, it's a tricky airstrip to land at. So it's not something that I could, he, he couldn't move because the ground was soft and he would have sunk in anywhere else. So, um, you know, it was just something that you could, you put your, you know, you, you use your training. You're like, okay, I know what my, um, best endurance settings are. So you just set those at any time you get to use those, those kind of trainings. It's really kind of fun. Very good. So do you have some particular flights or some memories or, or stories, favorite stories about a passenger you flew or a particular mission to deliver something that, that stands out to you, something that you'll remember for a while? Yeah, I think there's, I have several and I think some of them are longer than the other, uh, others, but, uh, one of them was I was flying around, um, AIMs, well, our, our, our big cheese and some of the smaller cheeses with him. But one of those guys, um, returned to a village that he had served in for 15 years. And so he, um, had grown, had planted the church and grown the church in this, this people group. And uh, he had been gone. He and his family had been gone for 15 years, um, out serving elsewhere. And so I was bringing them in to visit. Um, they had they had had some conflict in the church, and he was going in to just kind of mediate things. And so it was so awesome to watch him just interact with them. When we walked up, and people were crying and they were cheering, and it was just a lot of fun to see, you know, his fruit, the fruit from his labor. And just the heartfelt joy that these people had that he was back and they loved him. And I just, it's just stuff like that, that just fires me up and being, you know, the rest of the cultural stuff um, that isn't so pleasant just gets washed away. And you see Christ's church and the gospel moving and, and it just makes it all worth it. And so um, I think there's times like that, that I just cherish. Um, Another one was I brought for the first time I brought my wife and two girls to a remote um, village and we spent the night there. Um, an organization was graceful enough, gracious enough to let us um, let me take them along. And that doesn't always happen because we're always fully loaded. We're, you know, we don't go anywhere <laughs> with extra room. So um, it's really kind of them to let my wife and children and, and girls come with. So um, we're, <laughs> we're landing at the first airstrip and my, I had my my twelve year old daughter in the front seat, and she's like, "Dad, what are you doing? Where where's the runway? Where are you landing?" <laughs> and I said, "It's right in front of us." And she's like, "That's not a runway." So it's kind of funny to to hear them uh, hear their their uh, expressions at the first landing of an uh, unimproved airstrip. But uh, but that was really kind of fun to take them along and say, "Yeah, this is what I do when I'm out flying." So that was really kind of fun. Okay, those are good stories. Thank you. So tell me a little bit, we've talked some about it, but uh, about the struggles that you've had and so forth. Why don't you talk about some of the struggles and obstacles that you had just getting to the mission field, whether they were financial struggles, raising support, or or even p flight training struggles that you had with a particular maneuver, or anything like that? God has blessed us with finances. Um, we I have never worried about them. And I think God has just stepped in and said, I, and it was, I think part of it was, it was, um, one of those signposts for my wife to say, we, we have, God has provided everything we've needed and most of what we've wanted along the way. And so the finances to us have, have not been a problem. Praise God, because it was just his way of confirming it to my wife. Um, it's still work, you know, you still have to get out there and meet people. And I think that's a huge part of it is just being able to take people with you because everybody needs to know that God's working more than just with your neighbor. He's working with people all over the U.S. and all over the world. And I think it brings us all together. Um, so that aspect wasn't a struggle as much as just leaving family um, and our and our dear friends at church um, still uh, is painful at times. And, uh, you know, we're, we're only a year and a half into being gone from the U S but we left our friends at our church in 2012. So, um, it's been a while, but it still is at times, you know, you're still like, man, I just, I just wish I was home and, uh, with my friends. Um, as far as maneuvers, I think, like I was saying before, just getting out of my head, that whole, and, and for me, for my personality, this, the struggle is to be, um, 
just okay with that hundred feet off. And so that for me has been a struggle and, and they, you know, had to pound it into my head, return to the standard, return to the standard. And so that to me was really hard to learn after flying for, uh, what was it about 10 years before I got to SMAT. And so that, um, and then a check ride right before my commercial, an internal check ride at SMAT, um, man, that was brutal. It, it was, um, we had a new director of the flight school that had just come in. And so we didn't really know him very much. And so he was doing the check rides and, and he failed me. And I was, and it was because, um, you know, honestly, I can't even remember. I think I was doing lazy eights and, and I just couldn't nail it. And he was just like, let's just, let's just go back and we'll try it again. I'm like, no, I can do this, you know? (laughs) And, uh, um, and part of it was just being frustrated um, with his learning or with his teaching style and and because I hadn't been around it before. And so um, we're we're good friends now. But at the time, I was like, why can't you just go away? But I love Steve now. Um, great guy. But uh, at the time, it was a real struggle. And uh, we just re- we really worked through it, you know, and just I said, hey, I, I got to do this. I can't take you, you know, trying to re reteach me how to do these maneuvers. I just need to do them. And, and that was all it took. And then I just, the funny story is that during my commercial check ride, he wrote in my logbook, best lazy eights I've seen. <laughs> and I didn't prompt him. I didn't do anything, but I just showed, I showed our, uh, our guy and he was like, Oh, so I knew he could do it. And I said, yeah, I just uh, had to get out of the way and just do it. So. That's cool. So, so how, how have you struggled since being on the mission field, maybe in spiritual ways? Uh, Maybe you haven't, but I would imagine that uh, it's a time where you can start to struggle spiritually. Yeah, for sure. Um, Definitely the, the discipline part of it is just being, um, I think making sure you have accountability with, with people back in your culture who understand you. Um, and who do, we started, uh, a couple months ago. Well, not, not even, it was a month ago. I started doing a, a weekly update with, with my people, with our core sending team and just saying, here's what we're dealing with. Here's how you can pray for us. Um, because I really didn't feel like newsletters were deep enough for them because these are the people that are in the trenches with us. And so, um, you know, I think, the aspect, like I was saying before, just the aspect of um, making yourself make time for God and that relationship there is so key. Um, you can just be out here and start just working, doing the work, doing the work, but not your, you know, Christ wants a relationship with you. He doesn't want you just doing work. And so um, because you're taken out of all of your norms, you, you don't, there's no, Sunday morning, you know, normal church is what I would say in my culture. Um, there's no, we don't have a small group here on, on Friday night like we used to in the U.S. Um, all those things are gone. And so you're left with self-discipline and a support team back home who is keeping you responsible to spend time with God and really um, just grow your relationship. And I think it's hard. It, it can be easy to just go through life and not think about things, you know, but I've really been praying recently that God, you would show me where you are in all of this and, and where, you know, where are you working? And I just got back from a village, um, on Monday and it's a people group that's very remote. And, uh, like for example, clothes were just introduced not that long ago. (laughs) So the, uh, the children don't wear much at all. Um, but, uh, they, they, you come to the village and all they want to do is hold your hand and and they just want to go wherever you're going. It doesn't matter if you were walking 10 kilometers, they'd still want to go with you just because you're there and they want to be with you. And, I, and God just really opened my eyes and said, this is how I want you to be with me. Just take my hand and go where I'm going. And don't, you don't always have to, have to know where it is. You don't always have to be um, in the know about everything that's going on, just take my hand and I got it. Like I, I got stuff for you to do and you're going to be blessed through it. And, um, you're going to get to see me working and you're going to be a part of it. And so 
seeing those things, um, that's been my prayer. It's just, I want to, I want to, I don't just want to go through life doing work here because it's too easy to do that. And that's a struggle, but, uh, but to see where God's moving and to just be awake to those, those things. Very good. I appreciate you, you sharing about those things. Is there someone that you would say has been a, a mentor to you along the way? Um, I've had a couple, I think. Um, like I said, that that uh, pilot who furloughed, his name is Hank Cook, um, who was a JARS pilot for many, 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 many years um, and uh, served all over. Actually served in Kenya flying a DC-3 uh, for a little bit as well with JARS. But uh, he really walked me through the beginning part of the process and was always helpful with, with to answer questions. Um, when I got to flight school, uh, Neil Dubois, who is a JARS employee, but a flight instructor, he was at Moody for many years um, until they moved from Elizabethan to um, up to Washington. He stayed, um, he did a couple other things, but he ended up at SMAT and uh, just a really good mentor. Um, just uh, loves people but but um can tell it like it is you know he he'll tell you if you're really messing up or if you don't have a chance he'll he'll say that as well that was one of our aspects we said hey we'll come to smat but my wife said if my husband can't cut it you better tell us <laughs> so and and he's been true to that word as well and uh um i there's so many mentors here um, I, I, in Africa, but, but the one that stands out is Jim Strite. He's been in Africa for 31 years as a pilot and just has a servant's heart. Um, he goes above and beyond to make sure the missionaries are getting done what they need to get done. And just is a pure example of what a missionary pilot should be. So that he's, I, I look up to him a lot and, um, yeah, great, great man. Do you have any final suggestions, Pete, or any advice or encouragement for prospective missionary pilots? Um, I, the best thing to do is just to seek God and make sure that it's not your dream. I've, I have seen people go through all the training um, and, and it's been their vision and their dream, but maybe not God's. And at the end of it, if they fail the technical evaluation, um, it's just crushing. It just crushes them. And, and even to the point where they're like, I don't, you know, I don't even know about this Christianity stuff. So make sure that you hold on to it loosely. And then it is something that God's calling you to. And if it isn't, be okay with it. Like for real, be just say, you know what, this isn't what God has for me. Um, and I have to be okay with that. So that's the biggest thing is to hold it loosely. Don't, don't, uh, don't be crushed if it's not for you. So would you say that there is a book that you'd like to recommend to our, our readers or, or maybe multiple books that you would like to recommend? Again, it could be something about missionary aviation or something that helped you grow in your Christian walk or even something that helped you learn to fly. And you, you can, again, name as many as you'd like. Yeah, I, I, Crazy Love changed changed our lives for sure. Um, Radical by David Platt, also just a, a great book. Uh, Forgotten God, um, great story. I think as far as uh, yeah, as far as aviation goes, um, the book by Tony Kern called Redefining Airmanship is something that we studied at um, SMAT and actually read chapter by chapter, and we went through it. Um, it's kind of a it's a very technical ish read. But there are some good Air Force stories in there. Um, but it is good, it, and 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 that for me was important to read because t just talking about returning to standard and uh, reaching for excellence, and uh, just a really good book from that aspect. Is there anything else I haven't asked you about today that you'd like to add before we close? Obviously, A. Mayor is always looking for pilots, um, and uh, just like everybody else, but. Uh, but just to really, if you're seeking missionary aviation, look at the different um, programs because each program has a different personality. And so that's how one of the reasons we got to AIM Air because we really felt like it fit in with who we are, my wife and I, and our family. Um, and so that's part of it is just look at the organization and their um, 
their personality and how they uh, do different things. And, and that's a good way to get to uh, a decision on who to, who, to, uh, who to serve with. All right. Well, thank you so much. Let me ask you just a couple of more things, and, and particularly, how can our audience be praying for you? That's a great question. We can always use uh, prayer for so many things. But um, to be specific, it's just that we are really connecting with the people here. We've, we've gotten involved with our church um, here, and it is a growing church. And obviously, language is a struggle um, up here. So a lot of people speak uh, the local language, which is Turkana. And we don't know any of that, but they also speak Swahili which we know very little of, but more than Turkana and they, and less of them speak English. So we, we have been trying our best to uh, learn language and just to reach out to them just as our neighbors. Um, and my wife is better at it than me. She's an extrovert and she loves talking to people. So she's out there visiting schools and, and uh, we have a couple of students that we've been helping out just from a mentoring standpoint. So but, but just prayer that, that we have the endurance to learn language and to, um, to reach out to those around us and, and build relationships with them. Okay. Well, I will definitely be praying for you in those areas, and I'll include these in, in the show notes for the, the show, and, and I'm sure that others will be praying for you both as well. Before we do close, how can people connect with you on social media or elsewhere to learn more about you and and your ministry and maybe even become a, a financial supporter? Sure. Our, I, st- I uh, built a website um, when we started this whole process, and it's called Flying for Christ. And it's uh, the F-L-Y-I-N-G-F-O-R-C-H-R-I-S-T. And uh, that has all of our information on it, um, how to get involved, how to sign up for newsletters, how to uh, help financially and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, it's a great, great place to start. I post newsletters there as well. And uh, all, you can read all the way back to 2012 uh, if, you, if you're really bored. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I did put a lot of that stuff up there in a blog that I haven't maintained at all since we left the U.S. So um, all, all my, our history and that stuff is up there as well. I'm on Instagram. I'm uh, missionary pilot Pete. Um, and I, you're certainly welcome to follow me there. I try to post as much, uh, flying and life stuff that we deal with here in, in Loki and with Amir, um, just to kind of connect with people there. And on Facebook, I'm Pete Young, but there's about, I don't know, 15, 20 of us on there. So, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so connecting anyway through there and you can always send me an email uh, my email is pete.young at a-i-m-i-n-t dot org okay well thank you for sharing that information pete and again i'll make all of this easily available on the episode page on the plainfaith.com website so anyone awesome. who wants to reach out to you they'll they'll be able to do so i certainly appreciate your willingness to to let people contact you anytime yep that's if, if that's even if that were just my role is to get people uh, talking about it and, and thinking about it, that's I'm OK with that. <laughs> well, Pete, you have been an outstanding guest today. I've enjoyed uh, getting to talk with you a bit and getting to learn more about you and more about AIM Air and about your process of study at SMAT and, and so forth. It's been an outstanding educational experience for me, and I know that others will, will think the same. If there's ever anything that I could do for you or your family, just please don't hesitate to reach out to me and, and let me know. I'd, I'd love to be of assistance to you and, and to return the favor of you coming on the show. You bet. Thanks very much, Jimmy. It's been a pleasure to be here as well. And, and uh, like I said, the, the, more, the more that I can be helpful to uh, spreading the gospel, that's, that's what I'm for. So <laughs> thanks. Well, amen to that. And thank you so much again, Pete, for being on the show. All right. Thanks, Jimmy. Well, that's it for this episode. We thank you once again for listening. You can learn more about the podcast and subscribe to it by visiting plainfaith.com. That's P-L-A-N-E faith.com. You will also find links there to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
If you are interested in becoming a patron of the show, you can do that as well by visiting patreon.com forward slash plain faith. And of course, Jimmy would love to hear from you personally. So feel free to email him at jimmy at plainfaith.com or by using the contact form on our website. Until next time, remember that God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The intro and outro music for the Plain Faith podcast is a song called Chipper by Kevin McLeod. You can find his work at incompetech.com.